instrument, I have to re record the vocals. Mm -hmm. So it's quite a, um, let's say frustrating, but it was a taxing uh, experience to record it. Which it seems like every time we do a record and, and it's kind of rough, mm -hmm. it turns out really well. Because mm -hmm. there's something about that energy and that resistance um, that you have that makes that makes it uh, feel a bit more. Uh, it, it just feels more, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then, I mean, it's funny because um, all your grievances and all your uh, frustration and whatever it is, like the minute you we heard you, you hear the record is in its entirety and you see the artwork, you're like, it doesn't matter. Like mm -hmm. all that doesn't matter because. You create a piece of art, and, and, and art should be, you know, you should feel it when you do it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of one of those things. Like, um, there was a quote I saw recently. Like, art is, it's some to the effect of art is supposed to make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, do you <laughs> do you agree with that quote? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't always have to be like that, but I think that um, art art has many facets, but one of them is 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 to be confrontational. Mm -hmm. to make people feel a bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. and to take people out of their like the, you know the comfort zone because we're all like kind of stuck in like oh i like this and this is perfect for me and then art can challenge your perception of the world it can challenge oh, your absolutely. perception of yourself your privilege of, of your of your life and, and i think that's a, that's a cool thing when art succeeds in doing that. i mean a lot of art is just you know that doesn't matter but mm -hmm. but when good art comes along and i mean it, it does challenge um your ideas about the world and I mean for me it was always like uh, when I discovered music and I, I really got into music and I always viewed it as an art form mm -hmm. and an and art form is something that I like expands your mind and if you keep going into music and you go into art like I, you learn stuff all the time you learn stuff about yourself about the world about you know so, so yeah yeah, absolutely. So, like, based upon, like, the last record to this record, what are some things that you have learned about yourself in terms of this, in your, and, like, in your personal growth and stuff like that? Well, I think it's, uh, the last record, I mean, Freedom was very much a record that we had to make to sort of, uh, free ourselves from the shackles of refuse, if that makes <laughs> sense. We, we were like, what is this band that, that just took off without us? And we had to kind of bring that down and let refuse become our band. Mm -hmm. and, and we had when we when we did freedom we hadn't we hadn't written music in 14 years that's a long time oh, absolutely. yeah so we did that record and uh, we're trying out a couple of things um and i think what it was like like you'll try out things and then you play stuff live and stuff that might in the studio in in, in that world and you're like oh this sounds great but when you start playing live you're like yeah i'm not feeling this Mm -hmm. and, and the crowd's not feeling it so I think we were just trying to be honest about like what works for us what what feels exciting in the room what feels exciting when you're playing it and, and that's kind of that's kind of when we, we went into war music with that state of mind like what, what do we want what type of music do we want to create you know and I, I think personal growth is just a matter of like when you're young I don't think between freedom and war music. I mean, it's we're adults now, so it's like we, you know, <laughs> you, you don't change that much. <laughs> but I think one of the most important aspects of of um, growing up is is you need to learn how to follow the music, follow the art. Because mm -hmm. when you're young, it's a lot about your ego, and you're like, no, I wrote the song this way, so we can't change it, even <laughs> if it would be for the better, you know, because mm -hmm. it's. There's a lot of ego involved, and there's a lot of uh, you know your personal sort of uh, your personal investment. But I just learned to to kind of take a step back and be like, what serves the music the best? And I mean, okay, I have to rewrite the lyrics, I have to re-record the vocals. If it's gonna make the music better, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll do it. I mean, there's been a lot of times where I've been writing lyrics. Me and David does the lyrics together. I mean, I usually write like a outline and then we'll send it back and forth or we'll meet up and we'll sit. And when I send him lyrics, I'm like, this is cool. And he's like, no, this is horrible. I'm like, all right, let's start <laughs> over, you know. So, but I mean, when 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 we were young, that could have killed you, you know. That mm -hmm. could have been completely devastating. And now it's just like, wait, if, if this is not good enough, we need to raise the bar and forget about your ego. Just work with the music. And I think that's one of the most important things I've learned that just put your ego aside you know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah that's a great response and stuff like that i think that could be taken for 
anybody. Most people, yeah. most things in life, first of all, you know, oh, absolutely. Like, like to put your ego aside, because I mean, you know, we we invest a lot of ourselves in, in, in our daily lives, and sometimes we are kind of egotistical shits, just because, you know, <laughs> because, because that's, uh, you know, that's what you go to, but, you know, if, if you try to detach yourself from the ego, I think we will all become a little bit better people, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, um, what is, like, one thing that, um, this is just kind of based upon the conversation we're having, what is one thing you still find yourself catching yourself being ego, I don't want to say egotistical, but a little yeah, yeah, yeah. prideful, you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things, small things, and I mean, you know, I am the singer of a band. That's kind of an egotistical, I mean, it's not an egotistical thing, but it's quite the ego boost. Yeah. You know, to be up on stage and have that, but I, but I also think that maybe that hour of night, every night where I can sort of, you know, I, I can use all this extrovert energy and be, I would say adored, but you know, people like what I do, I think that's maybe grounds me for the rest of the day you know i can be a bit more mellow because i i get to live out that uh that fucking fantasy you know and i mean it is um i i understand people i mean you know we play smaller clubs you know we play some big festivals small you know but i can understand if you're like you know, a huge artist how um, addictive that thing is mm. and how easily it be to lose yourself in, in that but I mean, I try. I try every day to be a better friend and a better partner and a better, you know, brother. You know, like all of those things, and mm-hmm. just try to be, try to be uh, mindful of the people around me. But uh, yeah, we all deal with shit. <laughs> we all, we all have our own shit we have, need to deal with. Oh, know? absolutely. Yeah. And I, I do as well. Yeah. And um, so, what do you prefer then? Do you prefer like small, like smaller venues, like Fine Line Music Cafe, or do you prefer festivals? What do you prefer? I think I prefer these type of of, of clubs. Festivals are great because a lot of people that might not come and check you out at the small club mm-hmm. will see you. Uh, festivals, the festival crowds are fickle. It, you know, they're like they're a lot of there's a lot of passing through. Um, tonight, we'll know that most people that show up tonight they're super they were super into what we're doing, uh, and that's rad. So I mean, I like I mean I like clubs with between like. 500,000 people I think that's pretty awesome like that mm. that that's a good sweet spot you know mm. and then you know when you play in front of 20,000 people it just like it becomes very abstract it's just mm-hmm. like a mass of people it doesn't you know so uh, I like these type of clubs mm-hmm. yeah yeah I was gonna say like I even like when I cover shows I love covering shows this size yeah. just because there's a different type of energy than there is like an arena show or yeah, a festival yeah, sure. and um like my favorite song off the um album is called um, Malfire. Mal- Malfire. Malfire. Oh, yeah. I, sorry, there's a typo on my phone. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and um, like the lyric that I like that really stood out to me, it says it's a different type of war when the wolves are at the door. Yeah. And um, like it just, it's one of those lyrics that hit me in between the eyes. And because um, it's based upon my political views as well. Yeah. And um, what was going on in your mind like when uh, you wrote that or... We're, we're looking at what, what's happening in Europe to a certain extent in the States, but what's happening in Europe with uh, the war in Syria, when you had like a, you had a country that got bombed to bits because of like geopolitical circumstances that, that none of us can really figure out. But it is about money, it's about oil, it's about power, but the normal people, you know, like you and me, get to take the, you know, their homes are being destroyed. So they all come to Europe because, because I mean, we would do the same thing if our country got bombed to shit. We're like, let's go somewhere where you know, where it's not fucking war, you know. Mm-hmm. And they came to Europe, and and uh, there's like this huge uh, crisis of refugees. Oh and, wow! Yeah, that that happened, and then so all these refugees came to Europe, and then Europeans started treating them like they're like the enemy. So you're yeah. running away from war, and you come into. It's not a war zone, but you're coming into a, a situation where people just hate you because you're a refugee. And I mean, in countries like Hungary and um, Bulgaria, I mean, they wouldn't let, uh, you know, they wouldn't let people come in there and then they come to Germany and, and then people get super racist. So it's like being like just thrown from one horrible situation to another and, and all you want to do is live. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's all people want to do. They just want to fucking get by. They want to... They want to t- 
take care of their family, they want to fend for themselves, and they, they just want a fucking dignified life. And, mm. and we treat immigrants like they're the problem, while actually like there's all these other things that are happening that is actually the real problem of why we have refugees. And, right. and I, so we were, we were thinking a lot about that because it's been a huge issue in, in Europe for the last couple of years. And, a lot of people like look. I mean, like you know, like close the borders, like build the fucking wall. I mean, people just wanna, people just want a life. You know, that that's what it is. Like mm -hmm. most people who come here, they're just hardworking people that wanna provide for the families, basically. And that's that's what it is. And I mean, border, try to get in a better situation. Yeah, exactly. Try to get a better situation for themselves and their family, and and uh, and then you know, people treat them like shit, and, and they they're not gonna feel at home, and then you know, the wolves are at the door again. You know. Like, one more time you have something threatening yeah. you in your life and it's a horrible thing and, and uh, I think uh, hopefully in the future you know we'll be judged by how we take care of those who have the, the you know those who have the worst mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that that's a real thing and I think that it, it, it's also it also serves political purposes to, to to blame immigrants or to blame you know you know that you, you've seen that there's like a there's like a cartoon where there's like a cap list with like ten cookies, mm -hmm. and then there's like a worker with one cookie, and there's like a guy without a cookie, and the cap list says, "Watch out, he might take your cookie." And you're like, "That's right. I mean, that's the kind of world we live in, where where the one percent owns sixty percent of all wealth in America. One mm percent -hmm. owns sixty percent of all wealth in America, and then we think it's the immigrants' fault." That, that that cities are falling into disrepair, you know, and then you're like, no, that's not right. It's just like the redistribution of wealth. You're one of the country, uh, richest countries on earth, but you have a population where like, it's almost 50% of population that works double jobs, you know, because that's the only reason, that's the only way to get by. And I mean, and um, instead of saying like, maybe it is, it's, it is a problem with redistribution of wealth, we blame the immigrants. It's probably their fault, you know, and so it's, it's just like a, it's a way for uh, for the rich and powerful society to divert attention from from how this system works, you know. And I mean, it's I'll take an example. Um, we played in Detroit the other night, and, and Detroit. I mean, it's a little bit better now than it was a couple of years ago. But even I mean, it really fell into hard times because capitalism as a system has no moral, has no consciousness. Capitalism as a system is not like. I will take care of you. I mean, capitalism as a system takes care of the stockholders. It take, I mean, it, it's supposed to produce profits. So if, if your factory in Detroit, uh, you know, it is cheaper to ship that factory out to China. You mm -hmm. will make more profit. Mm -hmm. And capitalism doesn't care about those people. But it's right. still like it's so ingrained in our minds that, oh, this is the only system that we have. And, you know, so that kind of stuff happens all the time where factories move out, out brought, you know to other countries because because of lower taxes or you know just a cheaper workforce and then people here are like oh no it's probably immigrants fault that the economy is going shit but no it's not it's just you know just the way the, the economical system works and I mean there's a couple of people that are insanely rich in this country mm -hmm. most people are really poor mm -hmm. absolutely and, yeah. yeah I was gonna say like uh, Bernie Sanders had like this uh had this chart where it's like Bezos, Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates. They own more wealth than like 40% of Americans combined yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and a lot of those corporations and companies, like I saw like how Amazon, they won't let people have more than 10 minute breaks and they can't get health benefits and they work for like minimum wage. And you're like, are you kidding me? It's, yeah, you exactly. Know, like, so I mean, that, but that's what capitalism is. It's not like, it's not a moral system. It's just like a function that like, how do we make the most money? You know, mm -hmm. how how can we maximize profit, basically? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's 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 pretty crazy. Cause I mean, you know, America, and it's funny too because you know Bernie comes out and people are like, oh, he's a socialist, and then you're like, well, you love socialism if it's for corporations, if it's for banks, you know, if they bail out people, then it's socialism is fine. But anytime it's profits, or it's capitalism. So it's like. Mm -hmm. Anytime you know you make money, it's capitalism, but then you need to bail out. Yeah, we'll use like so. I mean, and also like I mean, the New Deal that happened after the Second World War, it's like a lot of social programs, you know, to to sort of boost the economy, and you know, so it's mm -hmm. 
you know, there's a lot of there's a lot to be said about this country, you know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There, there's absolutely. a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we can talk about. Yeah. 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 Just kind of a fun question for you. If um, let's say I had a refusal, if Bernie Sanders was in the mosh pit, how would you react? <laughs> I'd be pretty surprised. He's an old guy, but I mean, I I could see him. I could see him sort of back in our band. Yeah. Well, it might be a bit too radical for him, but I mean, definitely, uh, definitely, I could see him back in our band. It's funny because uh, Race Trader that opens up for us, they're singing Monty is like a human rights activist lawyer, and he's one of those guys. He's like, yeah, Bernie. I mean, you can call Bernie up. Like I met Bernie a couple of times. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh shit, that's crazy. So I mean, yeah. he's a he is a man where where he actually listens to people, you know, and and. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's not he's not perfect or anything, and you know I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that that's that's not as great as it could be, but we know where we have him. He's been saying the same stuff for the past like 40 years. You know, so, oh, absolutely. So we'll, we'll see. It, it's interesting. It's interesting to see where that takes. Cause I mean, that kind of like in the states more radical shift could be something that actually benefits a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And could be something that 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 gets you know gets a lot of people gets a better lives basically. Yeah, I feel like something has to give, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and I think it is. I mean, it is one of those things where if Bernie is not going to be elected, I think the divide between people is going to come even bigger. And I think yeah, like the whole paradigm shift that like you know like you have the left leftist people and the right wing people I think that's going to be even bigger if, if Bernie's not mm-hmm. you know he's not going to win and I mean America has been on a kind of a, a downhill slope for a long time now and mm-hmm. I, it, it's I mean you all you live it you feel it you feel that the oh, you know, like, like what's, what's actually happening so it might be a good thing to shake things up and see because I, I, a lot of people like when Trump came they're like well maybe this will shake things up and no it's just going to make things worse Someone, mm. someone's told me like, well, maybe now we'll get some good punk rock. I'm like, I'd rather have no punk rock than <laughs> fucking Donald like Trump. You know, I'm like, no punk rock. Just, you know, so it, it's yeah, it's it's wild times, you know. Yeah. So like, um, kind of something I think about is like, kind of go, going on this like with uh, when it comes to, like Spotify, Pandora and stuff like that. How has that affected you, you guys as a, as a band or as a music industry? How do you see that? Oof. That, that's one of those questions we could also talk about for hours because it's it, it's one of those things like I love the idea that music is accessible to everyone. Mm-hmm. Growing up in a rural 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 part of North Sweden, it was hard to find music that I wanted to find. It was really tricky, and I love the idea that everybody can get access to movies and music and so on and so forth. Absolutely, but it, it is quite complicated because there's been a, a whole mid-tier type of band like like Refused where, where, where the like every year that I mean I was lucky enough to be Refused in the 90s and even International Noise Conspiracy to be in bands that sold records you'd sell records I mean I can't even remember when we went on tour and the record label said don't bring records on tour we want people to buy them in the record stores you know like that you know mm-hmm. and um, I think every year the economy of, of being a touring band gets harder and harder because of, of, of the accessibility of music because all music is out there at all times so people want to tour to make money but it means everybody wants a tour which means that the venues can kind of pick and choose and they say okay we'll pay you this to, to come to the to, to play and we're like we can't afford that and then there's 20 other bands that want to do the show so it's like the economy of being like a mid-level band is, is it's pretty rough and mm-hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with um, with the accessibility and I mean the fact that Spotify aren't playing they aren't paying the artist any money you mm-hmm. know so you get like a million streams and, and you get like a couple hundred bucks you know and that's that's like wow. I mean if you, if you compare that like to selling a million records that you know then you'd be rich but, <laughs> you know so it's like it, it is a hard economy to be uh, to be a uh, uh, try to make a living as a, as a musician especially for like, I mean if you're if you're a DIY punk band you'll do fine mm-hmm. if you are Madonna Bruce Springsteen you'll do fine but just like the mid-level of bands that kind of you know as I said between 500 to 1500 people it's really hard to make that work because uh, you know you you make no money selling records you make no money on Spotify our music is sure so it's got 
being played on the radio, you know. So mm-hmm. like, it, it's it's a bit tricky, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say I I can't imagine the logistics behind it. Um, yeah. I was gonna say I have like time for one more question. It looks yeah. like and um. Like take us into like a, a refuse show. Like um, let's say nobody's ever seen your band before. What's what's the intensity like, and and where can people find you and stuff like that? Um, it's it's. I mean, we're very extrovert, mm. quite violent music. Um, it's not violent in the sense it's not like a dangerous thing to go to a refuse show. It's it's it is quite welcoming. But the, the the output of the music is quite loud and aggressive. Um, gets quite political at times on stage. <laughs> it, ha- it, it 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 has happened that I ranted a bit on stage. Um, but I mean, it's it's it is a bit of a spectacle, I would say. I mean, if you've seen us live, it's a bit of a spectacle. There's a lot of like uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know you want it to be exciting. You want music to be exciting. I remember. So here, here's something that, that I did. First time I played with my first hardcore band, before, even before Fused, no one liked hardcore in our town. No one, no one was into punk and hardcore. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was like, the, the, you know, maybe a couple of guys were into the Sex Pistols and, and some of the girls maybe were into the Cure or something like that. But no one was into heavy music like that, like, like fast hardcore. So the first show we played, we're like, let's make an impression. We smashed the guitar, we fucking... He ended, we ended the show, our drummer took his cymbal stand and threw it in the fuse box, and the whole place got, you know, shut Whoa. down. Last question? Yeah. Right. So, so the whole place shut down, and that's kind of like, that's kind of been my mentality ever since. Like, if you've never seen us before, you remember it. <laughs> you know, like that kind of attitude. Mm-hmm. And um, I always felt like, like you want to give people an experience. Like, you want to give people a really intimate kind of weird you know collective thing that's happening and i mean you know if you want to find us we don't tour that much and this is the only this tour is the only tour of the states we're going to do in 2020 oh wow yeah so it's like four if you want to see us in the states like 14 shows because we don't we want it to be exclusive not only for people to come and see us but also for us we don't want to be a band where we take this for granted where it's like oh we just you know there's some bands and, and hats off to them, it's a fucking commendable thing, but some bands these do 150 shows every year, just keep doing it, and we're like, if we'll do 80 shows in three years, it's pretty good for us, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, so I think it's one of those things, like, when we come to town, and like, you, you, you better make it out there, because you, you, I'm not sure when we're, we'll come back, you know? Mm-hmm. But we want it to be that way, we want it to be feel exclusive, we want it to feel exciting, and uh, yeah. And if you really like our band, come to the show, buy a T-shirt. That's kind of, <laughs> that's you know, that's worth. I think Absolutely. someone, I think someone said like, for a, for a touring band, if you buy a T-shirt, it's like forty thousand streams or something like that. I, I believe it. Yeah. So it's like it's something I mean, maybe even more. So it's like, come on and buy a T-shirt if you like it. You know? yeah, that sounds great, Dennis. So, well, yeah. that this gets me really hyped for tonight. So um. We're looking forward to seeing you and all that. So I want to thank you so much for taking the time to interview with yeah. me for Madness Creation. And thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm going to do my sound check now, I think. This is uh, Maddie with Madness Creation here with uh, Dennis of Refused. And uh, Dennis, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good. Yeah. yeah. Thank, I just want to thank you so much for having us and everything like that. Yeah, and, um, cool. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we reviewed the record War Music uh, a while back, and we gave it 10 out of 10 stars. Oh! Yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah, just... In your face, Internet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, what I liked about it is just how real and authentic it was, and it, it had some angry tones, but it seemed like you guys evolved mu- musically as well. Yeah. So, what was the most challenging reward aspects when you guys were in the recording process for War Music? Um... It was a long process, and it was one of those like you start out with a you know, idea of what you want, and then halfway into that you're like, no, wait, this is actually where you're going, uh-huh. which was can be quite frustrating. And uh, so there was a lot of uh, re-recording, and, and you know, like like there was a lot of songs that weren't really done, and then we had to re-record them, and then I did vocals, and then they changed the arrangement. I had to re-record the vocals. Mm-hmm. So it was-